Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. So in this video, we will be continuing the previous discussion on ethical and social issues in information systems. So we have seen that information technology has a huge ripple effect. So there are changes in the way we work, changes in society that it's not, uh, it's, it's so abrupt that society cannot catch up, that the regulations cannot catch up. And that's why there would be uh, several issues, both ethically and in a social manner, as well as in a political manner as well. And we would be looking at the different dimensions that refer to those issues. F, as we have seen, there are five dimensions to ethical, social, and political issues. And it could be seen here, information rights and obligations, property rights and obligations, system quality, quality of life, and accountability and control. And in these concentric circles, you would be able to see the level of these issues. If it's an individual issue, then it becomes an ethical issue. If it's at the level of society, then it becomes a social issue. If it's at the level of policy, it becomes a political issue. Policy meaning at a state level, for instance, or a national level. And those all is the result of information technology and systems. Let's take a look at the first one, information rights and application. So this has a lot to do with privacy and freedom in the internet age. For instance, privacy. Privacy is uh, the ability for individuals to be left alone, uh, not fearing being surveilled by other people, being seen by other people, and then the ability to control the information about yourself. The concept of privacy might be different from one country to another. Uh, and, and here in Indonesia, you would be able to uh, freely say, uh, la, la, let's say your age, or maybe conditions of your health, maybe uh, your religion, and so on freely without uh, feeling awkward. And you can ask other people about those issues. But in Western cultures, unlike uh, the Asian cultures, we would not be uh, easily asking people uh, what their medical condition is, how even how old they are, we can easily ask them. So it might be different from uh, place to place, but this is the main idea of privacy. And uh, privacy is something that is highly regarded. Now, the internet poses challenges to privacy. Like for instance, cookies. Cookies are, uh, the, the concept of a cookie is like uh, when you hear about a little red riding hood, okay, going into the forest. And then uh, that little girl, uh, in order to not be lost in the forest, sent uh, bed crumbs or cookie crumbs. And then the idea is uh, the girl would be going back by tracing those uh, crumbs. But it seems that the fox eats the crumbs and she couldn't go back. But uh, the idea is there that cookies are used to track visits to a specific site. Also, uh, super cookies or, or flash cookies. There's a web beacon. Okay, that's embedded in emails to monitor who is reading the email. There's also spyware that's put into a user's computer or could be also a, a mobile phone to spy on the user. Uh, maybe take a look at the camera, record the camera and so, so it can uh, see what's happening around uh, the, the computer or the mobile phone, for instance, or even uh, trying to transmit keystrokes in which if you want to 
uh, go into a site, you, uh, let's say let's say you want to go into your email or maybe your bank account, you would be uh, registering your password. And this spyware could be uh, transmitting your password to someone else. Also like uh, Google being able to capture every website that you go to, every uh, video that you go to, and then building a profile about you and then using that profile to target ads, uh, sell it to companies that want to, uh, to make an advertisement and tell them who, uh, tell the company who to show the advertisements to. So that's targeting, targeted advertisements. Uh, this is an example how a cookie works. So let's say here, this computer would be accessing the server and then uh, uh, the server would be sending information to this computer, uh, sending a cookie here for the purpose uh, so that when the same user goes to the same server, uh, this server knows who the customer is. It knows that you have been there before and you can, and it can greet you. Welcome back, Jane Doe. So it knows who you are. Now, is this a violation of privacy or not? It depends on the way we uh, take a look at things. Another issue is big data because now, uh, the ability of computers, the ability for uh, servers to store data is, data is so huge that everything can be stored all at once. You don't have to pick which data that you want to keep, but just keep all the data. So in that case, our uh, behaviors is actually recorded on the internet in uh, Google's servers or let's say Amazon's servers. And then they're able to see what we are doing, what we like, our preferences and so on using big data. Now, is this a violation of privacy or not? So that's also another issue. And then uh, we can see uh, some countries has required uh, companies to uh, give the option of opting out of uh, something like this. So for instance, Facebook, uh, at first they would be uh, sharing your data to companies. But if you go into one of their features, that's a feature to uh, opt out, to choose not to participate in that model. So they won't be able to sell your uh, privacy information but there would be a decrease in the facilities that you get. And uh, now there's also an, uh, a matter about how easy it is to opt out, whether you can easily uh, go to the feature of opting out or not. Also, uh, the online industry promotes self-regulation over privacy legislation. So uh, there's a, uh, a law in, for instance, in the United States that gives the immunity to uh, companies, to social media companies. So they are not able to be sued for the content uh, that is said by the users of the social media companies. So for instance, if someone lies uh, through Twitter or through Facebook, Facebook and Twitter is not liable for those lies. Uh, now, uh, the, uh, the law gives the ability for those companies to self-regulate, meaning that they can ban a certain user and then that user is not able to use that account anymore, maybe for a couple of days and so on. And it happened recently, for instance, uh, after the election in the United States that people have been purporting lies against it and uh, people have been uh, banned from using their social media accounts. 
Okay. There are some technical solutions for privacy issues. For instance, email could be encrypted so no one else can open the email except the person who is intended to receive it. There are tools to gain anonymity. For instance, if you are not able uh, to go to a specific site because it's not available in your country, or you do not want uh, people to know where your IP address is, the address of your computer is, uh, then you could use a VPN, Virtual Private Network, uh, to use a different IP address or computer address on the internet so people would not know your computer. There are also anti-spyware -spy tools that uh, would detect uh, like antiviruses that a uh, spyware is trying to go into your computer. There's also an uh, incognito uh, option in a browser, for instance. So you can do some private browsing without uh, the, the browser company uh, tracking your, uh, your visits. Now, the second one would be property rights or intellectual property. Uh, this is another issue, a dimension of uh, ethical issues. Intellectual property is intangible property of any kind created by individuals or corporations. If uh, you make a video, it could be your uh, property. If you make a writing, it's also your intellectual property. So there are three main ways that intellectual property could be protected. It could be a trade secret. If you have a restaurant and you have a recipe for a certain menu, that could be a trade secret. And uh, you can claim that it belongs to your restaurant. It could be a copyright. A copyright is, for instance, uh, when you make a book and uh, you say that it's copyrighted, then uh, of course you would have to uh, apply and submit your application to a certain agency in uh, your country. And then uh, in some countries, it uh, differ from country to country. In some countries, it could be uh, 70 years plus uh, the copyright. After 70 years, people would be uh, able to copy it freely, but in 70 years, they would have to pay a royalty to you, except if you waive the royalty. And also patents. Patents uh, would grant the creator of an invention a monopoly for 20 years. Now, uh, for instance, uh, in the drug area, okay, uh, that's why you have generic drugs uh, and you have patented drugs. So drugs that have been uh, used for more than 20 years, it could be freely made by other companies aside from the company that invented the drug, the medicine. Uh, that's generic drug. Uh, but this has been, uh, a, uh, there has been problems uh, uh, which companies, in which companies abuse these property rights. For instance, uh, the example would be Apple uh, in their iPhone. So actually Apple uh, and iPhone, they patented the concept of, of uh, scrolling, the concept of pinching the screen. If you want to uh, enlarge the screen or the writing, and then if you want to make it smaller, you uh, pinch the other way. Also the concept of a mobile phone being a rectangular shape, they patented that. And at one time, they sued uh, some companies, including like Samsung, because Samsung uh, made a device that was quite similar. It used the same rectangular, but uh, if we think about it, it's quite intuitive. Mobile phones should be rectangular shaped, not circular. And people would be zooming in by pinching, zooming out by also pinching the other way. So that's natural. So why did Apple uh, patent those things? And why was that patent allowed in the United States? So that's also an issue that we can look into. Now, there are challenges to intellectual property rights. Uh, for instance, uh, if you were to publish a book 
offline, a printed book, it would be harder to violate uh, property rights because at least you have to print it again if you want to copy it. Uh, in the in uh, outside of of our country, uh, the, the uh, printing out or, or photocopying something would be first. If it's a whole book, it might be illegal, or it could be uh, expensive because the cost of copying would be might be even more expensive than the cost of buying a book. But then, in digital form, a book could be more easily replicated. It costs nothing to uh, copy a book. And then you can easily transmit it, send it to uh, other people, or put it on a website, for instance. So it becomes a challenge for people to, uh, to protect their property rights if it's in digital media. So that's why there are some acts that uh, talk about that, like di the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. Uh, so, for instance, some media players would not uh, is not would not allow uh, playing uh, videos that are not uh, that are copyrighted. And then the third dimension would be accountability, liability, and control. Accountability is about the ability to track who is responsible for a certain damage that is done because of a violation. Liability would be uh, the ability to sue another person or another party through court uh, because of the damages uh, made by a certain company that violates uh, the, the laws. And then for instance, if it's computer related, so if a software fails, if let's say uh, we buy a software to write our thesis, for instance, and the software fails, it's an official software, we paid for it, and we wrote a lot of documents there, it fails, we couldn't retrieve, we couldn't open the document, and it's damaged. Now, whose responsibility is it that we lose our documents there? Is it the responsibility of the uh, software producer, or is it the responsibility of the hardware maker, for instance, or who is responsible? That's one thing. The next dimension would be about system quality, including data quality and system errors. So uh, when we uh, buy a system, or we, when we also make an information system, so what level of perfection is needed there. If there are bugs in the system, is it acceptable? Okay. Uh, but if it's flawless, then it might not be economically feasible. For instance, uh, Windows. If uh, Microsoft waits for Windows to be perfect, it might need years and they wouldn't be able to sell the, uh, the software. So that's why they constantly update uh, give a new version of the software uh, and fixes bugs and so on. So when they, uh, of course, there would be uh, beta testing, alpha testing, but even after that, even after the software is launched, there would always be updates in which they would be fixing problems. Now, which level of perfection is acceptable? Now, there are three principles of per performance. It could be because of software bugs. So the software is not programmed properly. It could be because of hardware. It could be because of bad data that's inputted into the system. It could be maybe not accurate. It could be faulty and, and so on. The next dimension would be quality of life. So how would information technology and information systems affect the quality of life of the users? We can see that there are negative consequences of using information systems, including the mobile phones that you have, including the social media tools that you're using. 
for instance, uh, about balance, let's say about a work-life balance. So you might be, uh, before when you leave the office, you would be able to just relax, not think about your work, go back to your family uh, and then uh, play with your kids and so on. But now you have to work full time, 24 hours maybe, because anytime your boss might be contacting you, texting you and asking you to do something. So this, that's one negative consequence of information systems of social media. And then here, uh, computing power decentralizes uh, decisions. So people could, uh, could make decisions more easily in groups. But then sometimes the key decisions is still centralized. The next one would be uh, the change in the use of information systems is so quick. Uh, the comp competition would be using information systems and IT as well. So sometimes businesses are caught off guard. They're not prepared to respond to the competition. Also, hear about boundaries, about uh, we were talking about uh, work a life balance, it's included here. Also boundaries that some issue that we talked to on uh, the internet could become a global issue, even though it's just a local issue, it could be uh, made a global issue. It could be made viral. And then dependence. So companies eventually depend more and more on uh, computers. There are examples here also like computer crime and abuse, which uh, for instance, hackers go into uh, computer systems and steal some information there. It could, might be spam uh, trying to clog uh, businesses from uh, working properly. There might be an issue in employment because of the use of information systems, maybe less uses are needed. Uh, you can imagine uh, the bank tellers. Now we have ATMs, automatic teller machines. So maybe the number of tellers would be decreased and that would be resulting in lost jobs. So that might be another issue. Also the issue of the digital divide. This is about equity and access. Access to computing power, access to uh, the internet. There would be uh, digital haves and digital have-nots. Digital haves are people that have access to the internet, maybe even broadband access, 5G access, access to computing power because they have more speedier processors, larger RAMs, memories, and so on. And they would be affecting the ability for people to perform, affecting the social mobility of people. So people keep, uh, people are not able to succeed if they don't have that kind of access to the internet and to computing power. It might become a problem like the problem we have in uh, health equity, for instance. There are also health risks. Uh, coming from the use of computers. If you use computers all the time, you uh, write a lot of things on your keyboard or on your mobile phone, that would be, for instance, uh, what we call repetitive stress injury because you move your fingers so quickly and then it's repetition, right? Uh, you can injure your fingers. You can also injure your vision, your eyes because you use uh, you, you take a look at the screen too long in a day. And there might be techno stress. You feel stressed out because you have to constantly check your uh, mobile, constantly work on the computer. You feel fatigue, you feel very tired, for instance. That's also another risk that you might have. Okay. So those are the five dimensions of ethical, social, 
and political issues from the use of information systems and information technology. And these dimensions could be used to analyze the problems that we see. If there's a particular phenomenon, we might be able to look at that phenomenon, let's say uh, the violation of privacy from Facebook, and take a look at which dimension they would be violating. If, for instance, someone spreads a lie through social media, which dimension would that person be violating? If we spread illegal videos, which dimension would they be violating? And so on. So that ends the second part of this chapter. Thank you very much. And wassalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.